Open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5, if you would. The message title today is The Truth and Nothing But the Truth. I'm going to read uh, beginning in verses 6 through 12. And um, if, you, uh, if you like circling key words in your scriptures, uh, in your Bible there, I mean, we've been dealing with love for quite a while. <clears throat> There's another key word you're going to find a lot of times. So you see the word testify or testimony, um, then you might want to circle that. See how many times you find it as well. It's a key word in this passage, testify or testifies, testimony, a form of any form of that word. Scripture says, this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he's not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. I have at home this Brittany Spaniel lives in the home with us. I've got another bird dog outside, but I've got a Brittany Spaniel named Joy who lives in the house. And I've had a lot of bird dogs over the course of my life, but she is by far the most intelligent. I'm actually amazed at how smart she is. My whole family would agree. Teresa would. She's, we've had lots of bird dogs together even. How smart she is. She knows what clothes I'm putting on and what that means. If I, when I put on my church clothes or even my, my, just my everyday office clothes, which aren't the same thing, she lay on the bed and barely raised her head. But I put on my workout clothes and she gets excited. She knows as part of my workout routine that I usually take her for a long walk and she gets to go. <laughs> If I put on my chaps or my coveralls, she really goes bananas. Or, or even my work boots, because she knows that's what I wear when we're doing our bird dog training. I mean, she literally can tell every detail of what I'm wearing, what that means. And, and she loves to talk. I don't know if you're, I mean, my, I got a bird dog outside of Dermot Shore here who barks. You know, she sees anything, she barks. But this Brittany in the house talks. She has this growly, yawning bark, and she, she, tr I mean, she tries to talk to you. We didn't train her to do that. We didn't, we didn't really encourage it any. She just does. When she wants you to know something, she tries to talk to you. It's the craziest thing. And of course, I try to talk to her. Now, our conversations are very unique and confusing. I mean, she gets about, I mean, I, try, I want her to understand so bad, she gets about a couple of dozen words or more, and she knows them really well, especially her name. I often think, man, if I could just get her to understand what I'm saying. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever wished that God would explain himself? I mean, be honest. I have. I mean, I'm just being honest with you. There are times like, God, I wish you would explain yourself. God doesn't owe anybody an explanation. He doesn't, even though I sometimes want him to. And besides, if he explained himself, we wouldn't understand it anyway. I mean, we wouldn't. We can't. Don't ask God to explain himself. It would be like Einstein trying to explain himself to my dog. We are not. The Scripture says his reasoning and understanding is so far above us, we're, we're not going to fully get it. Brothers and sisters, we live... <clears throat> by promises, not explanations. We live by explanations, not promises. The greatest promise that, that the Lord has given us is the assurance of our salvation, to know that we're saved. Look in verse 13. And that's where we're going to pick it up next week, but it's been the key point of this whole last section of John on confidence. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know. Not guess, not hope, not maybe no, you, you know. He said, I write these that you may know that you have eternal life. If you're not saved, you need to be saved so you can know it. And if you are saved, then you should know you are. Somebody said, if you could be saved and not know it, you could lose it and not miss it. 
The truth of the matter is, you can know beyond a shadow of doubt, you can know that you have eternal life, that you're born again. But the devil doesn't want you to have that knowledge. He doesn't want you to have that confidence. He's the author of fear. God is not the author of fear, the Scriptures say, but of love and of a sound mind. People are enslaved to fear. They begin to fret and to worry that maybe they are doomed. They'll never measure up. They'll never be accepted. Can you really know you're a Christian and going to heaven when you're saved? We said last week the answer is yes, and that the security of our salvation is a very critical issue for John. The whole last chapter is de- in, and part of chapter 4 is dealing with that main subject. He says you can, you can know it. You can know it right now, and you can enjoy the benefits of it presently. Last week, we learned the evidence of our salvation is found in three key birthmarks from John. If you didn't get to be with us last week, then look on our YouTube channel or on our website and, and, and catch up with that. So talked about the three key birthmarks of being born again. That birth comes from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of our soul. The confidence in the security of our salvation is based on the truth that Jesus is the Son of God and He is our only way to salvation. We looked at the birthmarks. Now we're going to look at the witnesses to that truth. First of all, John describes the witness of the work of Christ. This is He, meaning Jesus, who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. The Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is truth. Three that testify, Spirit, water, blood, these three agree. Have you noticed it seems like every TV drama um, is either a medical setting, a police setting, or a courtroom setting? I mean, it's the bulk of them by far. Because of our love for and appreciation of justice and the American way of doing it, we are attracted to such settings. You ever wonder what are the most popular? Maybe you didn't. I looked it up. I'm going to share it with you. See if you you know these. See if you can get them. Who's, Who's number one? Here are the list of the most popular, according to a poll, of the top 20 law and crime shows that we've had. Goes back a ways. Here's the top 20. We're going to start with number 20. Number 20, Matlock, 1986. Some of you weren't even born in 1986. But we're not done. Jag, 1995. Bull, 2016. Allie McBeal, 1997. (coughs) Excuse me. This next one gets me because I wasn't even born. Perry Mason, 1957. Night Court, 1984. <laughs> L.A. Law, 1986. We're walking down the top 20. I'm going to give you bother with the na- numbers till we get to the last one. Damages, 2007. Now, this one had several spinoffs. Law and Order Special Victims Unit, 1999. Blue Bloods, 2010. Law and Order Criminal Intent, 2001. The Practice, 1997. Bones, 2005. Better Call Saul, 2015. Law and Order, the first one, 1990. The Good Fight, 2017. How to Get Away with Murder, 2014. Like made a show out of that? Boston Legal, 2004. And here's the top two most popular crime and law shows of all time. The Good Wife, number two, 2009. And Suits, number one, 2011. I don't go away from here saying you didn't learn something. I didn't make it up, and they didn't ask me. (laughs) But it was a poll. But Americans didn't come up with courts. We didn't come up with witnesses. We didn't come up with testimonies. They've been around since the Bible. So I asked you to circle that word. It's the the last word in verse 6 or near the end of the sentence, depending on your translation. The Spirit is the one who testifies. It's the word martus. How many times did you find it? Some of you said eight. It's found actually no less than ten in its form. Sometimes it's harder to see. In the Greek language, that word martis, we have to translate that into English and make make it make sense. But actually in the Greek language, it is found no less than ten times in seven verses. You figure it's a key word? If he wrote it ten times in seven verses, he did. It is a word that's important. it, It means to witness, to stand, to testimony. John's picturing something here in these seven verses, and he is picturing a courtroom. 
He is making a case. It's like he's the lead attorney, and he's making a case in this courtroom in these seven verses. And he summons, John summons witnesses to the stand to testify that Jesus is the Son of God and the only way to salvation. And those witnesses are also those who testify to your own salvation. Picture John, the aged apostle. He's the only one left. The only, that his fame now in this moment is this the only original one of the twelve. And he's in his nineties. He'll be the only one that died of a natural death. Most all the rest have been gone for thirty years. And John is now the last remaining apostle in his 90s. Walking gingerly into the courtroom, feeble but still with a twinkle in his eye. And with a firm voice, he calls some witnesses to the stand. And the first witness that he calls to the stand is an interesting one. He calls water to the stand. It's what he says. Witness is the water. The witness... These witnesses testify, verse 8, spirit, water, blood. One is water. Water occurs four times in these verses. It's an important word. There have been differing opinions over the years as to what John is talking about here. But the historical context will help us. John has been arguing in, in his writings against the Gnostics, a heretic group. A heretic group who who did not believe Jesus was all God, but rather just a man who was anointed at his baptism, and then that anointing left at his crucifixion. That was their argument. And the whole historical context and based on John's arguments would 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 strongly imply, and I believe he is talking about Jesus' baptism and setting the record straight. Baptism seems to be the most logical. He's referring to baptism by water. So important is recorded in all four gospel accounts. And John would have been there, and John saw Jesus' baptism. John was originally another disciple, or he was a disciple of another person. Do you remember who he was his original disciple of? It wasn't Jesus. He started out with somebody else. But who was it? It was John the Baptist. He and his brother, Andrew, were disciples of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ. And John and Andrew were with John the Baptist when they heard John the Baptist testify that Jesus was the Son of God. In fact, it's recorded in John chapter 1, verse 30, beginning in verse 35. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, that's John and Andrew, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, when Jesus was baptized... Immediately he went up from the water. Behold, the heavens were opened to him. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, coming to rest on him. Behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, whom I'm well pleased. This combines some Old Testament prophecies. Psalm 2, verse 7. Isaiah 42, verse 1. He combines those as a prophecy of the coming Messiah. John the Baptist's baptism that Jesus went to was, if you remember, was a baptism of repentance. Jesus didn't need repentance. He was sinless, and yet he was baptized by John's baptism, having not needed it. In fact, theologian and seminary president Danny Aiken said, he no no more belongs at a baptism for repentance than he does on a cross for sinners. In both events, he identifies himself with sinners that he came to save. In other words, why was he at that baptism? Same reason he went to a cross. He is identifying with sinners. He didn't need it. It wasn't for him. It was for us. What did the water that's sitting on the witness stand, if you will, metaphorically, see? It saw the same thing. Water saw the same thing. John saw. Saw the Holy Spirit descend on Jesus at that baptism in visible form. We just read it in Matthew, the the record of it. Heard the voice of the Father from heaven say, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Both the Spirit and the Father testify that Jesus was not just man. He was all man, but He's all God. This is God in the flesh in front of you. Declared by the Spirit and the Father. John saw that and he would never forget it. With a firm voice, he calls the blood to the stand. The water is testified. Jesus' baptism inaugurated Jesus' earthly ministry of establishing our salvation. That's when it began. I mean, he lived a sinless life to that moment, but his specific ministry leading to salvation began the moment of his baptism. That's when it started. The, The witness of the water says he came to save us. Water steps down, the blood steps up. 
Blood is found three times. We had the witness of Jesus' baptism. Now we have the witness of his crucifixion. What is it, what is it that Jesus said on the cross? What was the, he said several things, short things. But one thing he said was the last thing he said. The very last thing he said was what? Three words. It is finished. Ministry over. Did you know John is testifying of the bookends? Jesus initiated this, his work as Savior at his baptism. He finished it on a cross. The blood speaks of the scourging of Jesus by the soldiers. The crown of thorns that were placed upon his head and the blood that ran down his face. The nails that were driven into his hands and his feet. The spear that pierced his side. Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully man who died a bloody death on a wooden cross for our sins. What happened at Jesus' death? Remember what happened to Jesus' death? Some phenomenal things took place at Jesus' death. One is that the earth became dark in the middle of the day. You could not see. It was dark as night from noon until three. There was an earthquake. Old Testament saints were raised from the dead. The six-inch six inch thick curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The Roman centurion declared that surely this was the Son of God. The baptism and the cross, bookends of Jesus' work, give testimony to the gospel, the Lord of glory who came from heaven and lived on this earth, and died on a cross, and rose from the dead, in order that God's justice would be satisfied, and our forgiveness could be offered. John says, this is the witness of the work of Christ. In these same three verses, we just first three verses we read, <clears throat> there is another witness John calls to the stand. This is the witness of the Holy Spirit. Three times in these verses, Holy Spirit plays an important role as a witness to Jesus as the Savior. The Holy Spirit was present at Jesus' conception. He was present at Jesus' birth. <clears throat> he was present with Jesus throughout His sinless life. He was present with Jesus in the garden. He was present with Him at the crucifixion. He was present with Him in the resurrection and present with Him in the ascension. The Spirit <clears throat> is the Spirit of truth and what is the Spirit's primary responsibility? What is the Holy Spirit's first and foremost role in the Trinity? What is the Spirit's primary job? Jesus told us in John chapter 15, verse 26. When the Counselor comes, the one I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. <clears throat> you know what the role of the Holy Spirit is? The number one role is to point people to Jesus as Savior. It's the number one thing. Holy Spirit does. And He does other things. But His number one, most important role to glorify Jesus Christ by pointing people to Jesus Christ as the Savior. You can't be saved without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts you of your sins. The Holy Spirit is the one who convinces you of your need to surrender to Him by faith. The Holy Spirit is the one who empowers you to have faith. It is the Holy Spirit who converts you by regeneration. And it's the Holy Spirit who seals you forever. The Holy Spirit, <clears throat> therefore, enables you and empowers you, excuse me, to follow Jesus as your Savior. Follow Him in your life. It's the Holy Spirit who enables you and empowers you to share with others how to come to know Him too. Can't be saved without the work of the Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus. I love the way James Merritt says it. He says, the witness of the Spirit is God's witness to us, in us, and through us. Just as the arrow of a compass always points towards the north, the Spirit of God always points towards Jesus. When John is not done. He said, I have another witness. <clears throat> I've got a call to the stand. Verse 10, whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has born concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. John calls the Father to the witness stand. 
You could call no one higher. <clears throat> call the Father. The Father was in charge of it all. His, his entire plan to rescue us by the work of Jesus Christ, the entire book of, is about salvation in God's plan. In the garden, it was the Father who promised that through Adam and Eve, the ones who <laughs> hurled us into our sinful nature, He promised that through their seed would come the Messiah, the Savior, the one who would bear our sins and give us eternal life. He sent throughout the entire Old Testament, right up into the New Testament with John the Baptist, prophets and forerunners to declare the Messiah was going to come and give us eternal life as Savior. He sent an angel to Mary to announce Jesus' birth. He sent John the Baptist as the forerunner. He sent angels to sing to the shepherds and announce His birth. The Father sent wise men to come see Jesus and acknowledge Him as King of the world. The Father said at Jesus' baptism, This is my beloved Son. And the Father sat Jesus, His Son, on the throne when He ascended unto heaven and gave Him dominion over everything. The Father did all of this so you and I could be saved. John is now using a, what, he, what we would call a greater to lesser argument in these two verses. What do you mean by that? I mean, John is saying, we believe man all the time. How can we not believe the Father? If we believe man, how can we not believe God? I mean, you believe people all the time, do you not? I know you do. You exercise faith every day. You go to a restaurant, you'll probably go today, and you will eat some food cooked by somebody else. You don't even know. You're sitting in this building exercising faith because you have faith that the engineers designed it in such a way the roof wouldn't cave in when you're in here. You may have declared, I think the roof might cave in if I go into church, but it didn't and it's not. You came anyway. You get on an airplane to fly. You haven't seen the pilot. You haven't even met him. You didn't examine the airplane. You didn't look for crack, cracks in the in any part of it or how much fuel it's got, you just got on it and he cracks the throttle open and you take off and fly across the ocean. Exercising complete faith. You go to a doctor and your doctor examines you and writes a prescription that neither he nor the pharmacist can even read. And the pharmacist goes back and takes some stuff off some shelves and mixes some stuff together and gives it to you and you take it. Because you have faith. We exercise faith every day. <laughs> you put all your faith and you put all kinds of faith, in fact, faith of your life in people every day. But listen, people can lie, but God never lies. He cannot lie. How much more could we trust His witness than anybody else? As one man says, we, what we confess with our mouth, God makes real in our hearts. John chapter, or excuse me, Romans chapter 10, beginning verse 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness. One confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. By the Father's design, the Holy Spirit comes and confirms in our heart, in our spirit, in our human spirit, that we're saved. Also in Romans 8.16, the Spirit Himself testifies together with our spirit that we're God's children. The Holy Spirit tells our spirit we're His. God says there's only two classes of people, lost and saved, believers and unbelievers. Those go into heaven and those go into hell. Everybody only has, there's only one of two destinies. Eternal life or eternal death. God has testified, this is what John is saying here in the end, or in verse, verse number 10, whoever does not believe God has made God a liar. God has testified that Jesus is the Savior, and that if you simply surrender your life to Him by repentance and faith, you can have eternal life. So to deny that is to call God a liar. And how, in, in that respect, how could, God, how could we expect anything less than eternal punishment? By calling God a liar. John is saying it's your choice. In our last two verses, he says... This is the testimony that God gave us, eternal life. This life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. 
Friends, eternal life is not a quantity of life. It is a quality of life. We follow that. Stay with me now. Eternal life is not a quantity of life, as the Scripture indicates. It's, it's a quality of life. Not quantity, it's quality. What do I mean by that? I mean everybody's going to live forever. Everybody will live forever. Once we've been conceived into this, we, we, we will live forever. We either live forever in heaven or we'll live forever in hell. Everybody has life that's unending. So eternal life is not just unending life somewhere in, the, in that everybody has that. <laughs> when the scripture says those who have Jesus have eternal life, he is talking about a quality of life. Eternal life is having God in you and with you. It is sharing in his life through a real personal relationship with him. It is bearing the fruit of his life in you and coming forth from you. Because his spirit is in you. It's the confidence that you will spend forever with him, with him personally, not forever separated from him. That's eternal life. Do you notice the verb tense in the last verse? Whoever has, whoever has, not had, whoever has the son has life. Do you see the verb tense? What, what, what tense is that? Any English, English teachers here? It's the same in English as it is in Greek. It's present tense. Did you catch that? Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever has the Son now has life now. Note that. It's important. Why is that? It's present tense. Because John is not pointing back to some prior experience in past memory that the devil can play with you about. Not knowing the exact moment of your conversion does not mean you're not saved. What do you believe now? Whom do you trust now? Who who are you resting the assurance of your salvation in today? Neither does John point to an emotional feeling on the basis of our experience. Or making it the basis of our assurance. (laughs) I am so thankful that God's commitment of giving me eternal life is not dependent on my shape shifting roller coaster feelings. The great pastor Charles Spurgeon said, Many, many go to heaven with very little comfort on the road. I do not commend them for their lack of comfort. But I do advise you, instead of looking to singular experiences as a ground of confidence, Look to the bleeding Savior and rest alone in Him, for if you have Him, you have eternal life. Did you catch that? But quit looking at a moment somewhere that you said something right or did something right. Just look at a bleeding Savior for you. Put your trust in Jesus, not what you said. God wants you to have confidence in your salvation, to experience assurance and joy. Peace that comes from having eternal life. I love that the great Adrian Rogers once said, it's much better to be a shouting Christian than a doubting Christian. Adrian had a way with words. They were pretty simple, but powerful. He goes on to say, we ought not to walk around like a question mark where their head's been over, but like an exclamation mark. And John, the apostle rests his case, and the gavel falls to the desk, and you must make a decision. The witnesses have spoken. What is your decision about Jesus? Have you made your decision about Jesus? You see, because you already have. You say, well, I'm still, I'm still trying to figure that out. I'm still working on it. No, according to Jesus said in John chapter 3, that if <clears throat> those who believe in him have eternal life, but those who do not are condemned already. It means you've, already, you've made your... If, listen, you're, if your choice is not to decide, then your choice is not to decide, and you don't have your life. You can only get eternal life by deciding to have it. If you, there's only two destinies. There's only two choices. There's nowhere in the middle. Now, if you have a major decision, quote-unquote, you have, it's not to accept Jesus, you can change that right now. 
You can choose him. Why wouldn't you? I don't know about you, but I want to go with him and live with him forever in heaven. And this place down here is a rat hole. Hello? My great-grandma's been gone a long time now. She died when I was eight years old, but I'll never forget. She, she, <laughs> here's the way she described this, this world. It's like a snowball rolling downhill towards, well, you know. <clears throat> she also say it's going to hell in a handbasket. I had no clue what that meant. <clears throat> but I bet she's right. Amen? <laughs> why, 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 why would you want to go there? I mean, you don't have to if you accept Jesus as your Savior and Lord. And if He's spoken to your heart, you know it. You, you, you know you need it. You know you just need to surrender. It's pounding on your chest, and, and, and you know one day this life is going to be over, and you're going to stand before Him, and, and you're going to, what are you going to do? Make up excuses? What are you going to do? Try to, try to get, get Him to, to look at your log of good things and bad things and hope one weighs out the other? Are you sure? Because the truth is, it won't, that even won't even work. <clears throat> no matter how many good things you have on there, the wages of sin, not sins, the wages of sin is death. It only takes one, and you're toast. The only way to go to heaven is not by your efforts, it's by His. What He's already done for you. You just have to accept it. Why won't you? And those of you who have, then rest assured. Satan sticks his old ugly head up to get you to doubt. Take a swing at it. What is it? it was that game like gophers, you know. Whack-a-mole, whack-a-mole. Why can't rascal in the head, underground, thieving, well, you know. <clears throat> Let me get lost. You're resting not in your abilities, you're resting in Christ, and he can't do nothing about Jesus. Let's pray. If you're here this morning, <clears throat> or you're listening online with us today, and you've not accepted Jesus as your Savior, then I want to invite you to do that right now. Right now, you, you don't even have to be in this church building. If you're listening online, you can do it too. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior and Lord, then why not? Reach out to Him. It, it, you, you can just pray and, 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 and tell Him you want Him to be your Savior and Lord. And your, your prayer is not magic words. It's, it's a decision of the heart, but the Scripture does tell us to confess with Jesus, our, as, confess Him as Savior and Lord. So confess to Him in your prayer that, that he is. <clears throat> Acknowledge that to him. Just think about it, but tell him. In fact, I'd, lo I'd love to help you. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer right now that for someone here or someone listening who just doesn't know what to say, if these words express the sentiment of your heart, I invite you to repeat them to the Lord behind me. So let's begin to pray now. If that's you and you want to, to, to give your life to Jesus, then, then just in the quietness of your heart and mind, pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for speaking to me today. I thank you for Jesus who died on a cross for my sins. Indeed, God, I am a sinner. I am accountable to you. I have done things in my life and thought things in my mind that I know are wrong. And I need your forgiveness. I believe Jesus is my only hope. I believe he died on a cross for my sins. I believe he rose from the dead. And rather than being the boss of my life, I want to surrender my life to, to Jesus. I want him to be the Lord of my life. I trust in him right now in this moment by faith. And I thank you for the gift of salvation that you offer me for eternal life that is now mine, not because of me, but because of him. It's in his name I pray, in the name of Jesus. I ask this. Amen. If you're here this morning and you're listening online, we'd love to sh celebrate with you. <clears throat> in a moment, Pastor Gary and I are going to be at the front, and if you're here and you'd like to pray with us or share with us that you made that decision, and we, we want to pray with you and talk to you. <clears throat> Or maybe you want help, further help. When you have a question you want to ask us, we'd, we'd love to be here for you. If you're listening online, 
you can reach out to us as well through our website. Message us on Messenger. We, we would love to follow up with you and, and help you as well. And for all of us, maybe we need to do a little whack-a-mole, you know? Tell Satan to get lost. Leave us alone. We know our securities in Jesus and Him alone. So maybe that's some things we want to pray about this morning. Altar is open. We'll be here to help you if we can. You can come pray by yourself, and we're going to spend a few moments responding to the Lord. Let's stand together as we continue. <laughs>